Beasts of Prey Chapter Number 6 The Color of Midnight Akon ran through Lakosa's empty streets, sons of the six flanking him on all sides. 282 steps from the temple of Lakosa he counted, a good number. The cheerful dean that had filled the city earlier was gone, and the few denizens still outside shop fronts did not wave or cheer as the warriors passed. It wasn't hard to imagine what their group must have looked like. A pack of uniformed men, spears and stern faces, charging into unknown danger. He gripped his hungeries leather hilt in one hand and tapped his fingers against his side with the outer. 284 steps, 285, 286. It didn't take long to reach the night zoo, though Akon still paused as the hill it perched upon loomed into view. Of course he would heard about the zoo. Every Lacosan child grew up with stories of its wonders and terrors, but he would never actually visit it or dare to come so close. It bore an uncanny resemblance to a prison. A large, bricked-in compound with the walls at least tw twice its height. Flickers of gold-orange flames were visible and even several yards away, the arid stench of smoke and burning grass stung his eyes. They kept running until they would reach the zoo ornate black steel entrance gates. Kamau, positioned at the head of their group, stopped before the gates and turned. He looked every bit of a true captainy. We need to move quickly, he said. The vegetarians around this area is very dry. Especially the lemongrass fields. If the fire spreads to it, Lakosa proper will be decimated. We have to contain it, then extinguish it. So we'll work in groups. He pointed to several seasoned warriors. You will join me in the search and rescue. We'll start on the south end of the zoo and move west. He looked to another group. You're going to be runners. You will take buckets of water air to the areas where the fire is closest to getting out and work to contain it. Don't let up for any reason. Come on. I can almost regretted speaking up as the eyes of every warrior shot to him. He couldn't discern the look on his older brother's face. So he braved the rest of his words, sorry, Captain, how can I help you? Kama was already looking past the night zoo open gates. There should be a well somewhere inside the zoo. City ordinance requires it. You, Shomari and Fahim will be in charge of refilling water buckets to hand off to the runners. Make sure there is always one ready for them. Disappointment flooded Akan. There was no way being a bucket boy would be enough to prove his worthiness to father Alufami and the warriorship. He was all too aware that he hadn't actually grabbed his name from the basket of mambas in the temple before being called away which meant that technically he hadn't completed his last rite of passage if he could prove himself here. He swallowed a lump in his throat. Kamau gave them all a measured look. There are indentured servants in this zoo called beast keepers, he said. They are mostly indentured jeeds and no doubt some of them will be trying to escape in this chaos. If you see one of you are able to secure them. They are under legally binding contracts and not permitted to leave the zoo's grounds. Move out. He turned on his heels and the rest of the Yaba warriors obeyed. Following him through the night zoo's entrance and into the compound with whoops and war cries. As soon as he was inside, Akon winced. It wasn't just hot hair, it was sweltering. He would never know how loud a fire could be. Its roar was thunderous. All around him, people in grey tunics were running, screaming, and they were 
not the only ones. The hairs on the back of his neck stood on and as something shimmery and scale barreled past him with a snarl, sending waves of heat in its wake. A few feet away, another shape, hairier, fled the growing flames. The beast of the night zoo had been freed. Go to the well. Kamau swung his spear in a wide arc and something horned charged at him. Ekan watched him disappear into the plumes of smoke. Please be all right, he silently prayed. Please be okay. Okojo. Ekon jumped as someone shoved him, surprised and annoyed to find Shomari glaring at him. Get moving, the well's over there. Ekon bit back a retort. He and Shomari ran across the lawns to the well where Fahim was already standing and started filling buckets. Beastkeepers were also desperately carrying buckets of water and haphazardly throwing the water onto the fire. But it was no use. Akon snatched one of the buckets, none too gently, from the bewildered old man. His eyes shot to a large tent entirely engulfed in flames. Likely the original source of fire, Kamau was right. They had to get it contained fast. He plunged the bucket into the well. The water was lukewarm and foul. But a runner was already racing towards him. No sooner had he passed the bucket off to him and refilled, the empty one dropped at his feet, then another one was coming, and then another. It was repetitive work, the muscles in his arms and lower back twinged as he stooped over and over to pass off refilled buckets and picked up empty ones. His heart lifted as he looked across the night zoo's scorched lawns. One of the smaller fires had been doosed. A team of warriors was now battling the main one near the giant tent. His eyes were still searching when he saw it. Saw them. Two grey clad figures were running across the night zoo's grounds amid the chaos one glancing over her shoulder every few strides. Two, a bad number. The first woman wore a head wrap and looked old enough to be his mother, but the second could have been his age. Even from a distance, Akon saw a fear reflected in both her faces, a fear of people running for their lives. They were trying to escape. Akon glanced over his shoulder as he threw another bucket into the well alarmed. Hey, he shouted, we have got two potential escapees heading for the wall. Fahim was still refilling buckets as fast as he could, but at the words, Shomari looked up eager. Not for long, he dropped his bucket at the same time Akon did, and together they broke into a run. Their strides were evenly matched as they closed the gap between themselves and the fleeing beast keepers, the younger of the two, was already at the zoo border wall. The older one was climbing up the vines to follow suit. They are going to get away. Shomari stopped, pulling his slingshot from his disc belt. No, they won't. He snatched a rock from the ground, knelt, then shot with perfect aim. The stone soared across the lawn like a bird of prey, striking the older beast keeper in the back of the head so hard she fell from the wall Akon flinched as her body crumpled on the ground. Got her, Shomari punched the air, then shot another rock. That one hit the second beast keeper, the girl square on the shoulders, one more and she will. No, Akon was already running. The girl on the wall's top ledge had turned her back on them. Teetering dangerously, his lungs burned as he inhaled smoke and grew dizzier. But he shouted at her anyway. Hey, wait! The girl only glanced over her shoulder. Akon knew what she was going to do, but he still gasped when she leaped into the darkness. 
No, Akin stopped short just as Shomari caught up to him again. She jumped. Shomari swore aloud. Already turning to head toward the night zoo's entrance, we can still cut her off. I will go around the back, you take the wall. Akon sprang into action, charging toward the wall before they could pause to think about it. The older beast keeper, the one Shomari had shot down, was lying in the grass unmoving. But Akon didn't stop to look at her. He vaulted up the vine-covered wall, scrabbling to get over it as fast as he could. The world darkened as he reached the ledge of the girl, had been balanced on only seconds before. As he leaped as she had, landing hard in the dirt on the other side. His eyes panned, then stopped. It had been ten years since he had been the four-legged creature, staring back at him in the darkness, though that didn't make it any less terrifying. He drew in a sharp breath as the beast eyed him. Illuminated in the horrified red-orange glow from the fires on the other side of the wall, its body was leonine. The skin stretched across its lean frame, the pale pink color of something that hadn't seen true sunlight in years. Akan knew what it was, the Shaitani. There was a half-second pause as it studied him, bearing a row of yellow teeth crammed into a gummy black mouth that would have been frightening enough in its own right. But the animal's teeth weren't what rooted Akon to the dirt. It was the thing's eyes. They were emotionless, two black pits that threatened him to swallow him the whole. They rendered him immobile, helpless. As the familiar voice rose from the back of his mind, he found he could do nothing to stop it. He couldn't even make his fingers count. Son. Baba's voice was desperate as ever. Son, please. Akon wasn't standing near the greater jungle border now, but it didn't matter. It seemed the jungle's every sense had sought him out. A living nightmare perched from its most wretched depths. At once, he was a little boy again, staring at a monster as it towered over his father's body. Please, Akon. In his memory, Baba's body was broken. And there was too much blood. Please, son. But Akon couldn't move, couldn't help. As the Shaitani held his gaze, he knew that, that the creature wouldn't be the thing that killed him in the end. It would be the fear. After all these years, the beast still laid claim to him, the ravaging his body like an incurable sickness. He screwed his eyes shut, waiting for the creature to advance and finish him. Then, go, Akon started his eyes flying open again. The voice that had spoken wasn't Baba's and it hadn't come from his mind. It was softer, lighter, his eyes fitted right and focused on a figure standing just a few feet from him in the darkness. Still as stone, the girl in the moonlight he saw, she had a small broad nose, round cheeks and a slightly pointed chin. Black twists curtained her face, stopping just past her shoulder. She wasn't looking at him but at the shaitani and her expression managed to be both tentative and calm. She regarded the beast as though staring at something faintly familiar, a contest waiting for violence but the shaitani did nothing. It seemed as perplexed as he was by the girl. A moment passed among the three of them, and then Akon felt it. The sensation came quietly at first, a low hum, like something rumbling just beneath his feet. It grew palpable in the air, heating it. Then, go, the girl said the word again, this time louder, surer. It seemed to surprise her as much as it surprised Akon. Another second passed before the shaitani jolted without warning, retreating into the lemongrass fields and leaving the two of them alone. 
it understood her. Akon stared at the place where the creature had been trying to process what he had just seen. He wanted to pinch himself to do something to prove to himself that this was real, but he couldn't move. It listened to her. He realized she told it to go and it listened. It obeyed. For her, for her own part, the girl still hadn't moved. She was staring off into the blackness, as though seeing something he could not. A long silence filled the space between them before instinct took over and Akon closed the gap between them. His fingers locked around her upper arm and she jumped at the sudden contact. He was shocked to find her skin was hot to the touch, almost feverish. In that moment, in that touch, he felt as though something was radiating from her to him. That same peculiar thrum so strong it rattled his teeth. Her weary gaze lifted to meet his. And from some detached place in the back of his mind, he noted that her eyes were exactly the color of midnight. At least if he would imagine such a thing could have a true color, his grip on her arm loosened, but he didn't realize he would actually release her until she stumbled back from him and began to run. She wasn't terribly fast. He could have caught her again if he had wanted to, but he didn't. Akon watched until she had disappeared into the lemon grass. A feeling like relief grazed him only a moment before a voice shattered the night. You let her go, Akon swiveled. Shumari was standing feet away, having just rounded the corner of the night zoo's wall. His expression held indecision. As he looked back and forth between Akon and the surrounding fields, there was a terrible pause. Then Shumari turned on his heels and ran. No, Akon tore after him, heart thundering in his chest. The smoke in the air was thinning, the roar of the fire dulled in his ears. It seemed most of it had been put out, but Akon didn't care now. His focus was singular. He couldn't let Shomari tell anyone that he had just done. He would let the beast keeper girl go deliberately. If any of the other warriors found out, if Father Olufemi found out, he ran faster, but it was no use. Too soon they were back inside the night zoo, stopping short as it will. To Akon's horror, several sons of the six were already standing there, surrounding a larger group of people sitting in the grass with bound wrists. These had to be other beast keepers. One that either hadn't managed to escape or hadn't bothered trying. Each one of their somber gazes was locked on a man wearing a cheap looking red dashiki a few feet away. Will cost thousands in damages. The man was saying, you must appeal to the Kohani tonight and tell him, I need immediate relief and financial aid from the temple's coffers. I am a God's fearing man. I pay my debts. You will have to lodge a formal request with the temple's fiduciary committee. Baz. Kumau's words were clipped as he looked down his nose at the man with only thinly veiled disgust. We are not responsible for the disbursements of its funds for now. I suggest you salvage what you can. We were able to recover every beast keeper who tried to run. Not all of them. Shomari's words split the night. Akon watched his co-candidate step forward with a smirk. Akon let one of them go. Every warrior in the vicinity straightened, their faces growing stony as Shumari's words sunk in. Akon watched Fahim standing nearby as his eyes widened in horror. Baz Mumbai looked nothing short of confused.
The worst expression, however, was Kamau's in two strides. He would close the gap between himself and Shomari and grabbed a fistful of boy's kaftan. He pulled him so close the tips of his noses were almost touching. When he spoke, his voice was a growl. If you ever accuse my brother of such a thing again. Kamau's is true. Shomari's eyes lost their smug clam. As Kamau's grip tightened, I saw him do it with my own eyes. He let one of the beastkeepers go on the other side of the wall. She was wearing a beastkeeper uniform, I swear by the six. Kamau's eyes followed Shumari's trembling finger before looking at Ikon. Gone was the rage, the instinctive protectiveness his older brother had always harbored for him in its place was something far worse shock. Eki whispered, that's not true, is it? Ekon's blood turned to ice. Another dull roar filled his ears, but this time it wasn't from a fire. His mind seemed to break into a million pieces. He couldn't gather under his older brother's waiting gaze. Every instinct in his body told him to lie, but the confession escaped him before he could stop it. It's true. He would have given anything in the world not to see the look that touched his brother's face just then. There was no adequate words for it. It was a collision of disappointment, disgust, and the distinct pain of watching something break, something that would never be quite whole again. None of the other Yabai warriors dared to speak, only the crackling remnants of the fire filled the silence. Do you mean to tell me? Baz finally said in the indignation that sons of the six now break their law without consequence. He looked to come out, tell me which committee shall I speak to about? Silence. Every head swiveled in the direction of the voice that had spoken a voice I can wish to every god and goddess. He heard not heard anything. The world seemed to slow as father of Alufmi ambled across the night zoo, smoldering lawns. His mouth was hard set, the skin between his brows pinched hard. The boy is no warrior, he said, but he will punish. Akon's finger danced of their own accord, tapping hard against his leg in a frantic beat. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. He tried boiling his hands into face to seal them, but with so many eyes on him, it was impossible. Centuries seemed to pass as Father Lufmi continued forward, then stopped at a few feet his opposite. His gaze was unflinching when he spoke. Candidate Kojo, his voice was entirely too soft. You have willfully abetted the escape of a legally indentured servant. And in doing so, you have stolen from this man a debt fairly and rightfully owed. This is both a crime and an act of sin. There was no place for either among the six sons of the six. I didn't look away from Father Aluf searing gaze, but in his periphery he felt the other warriors watching him, their distaste palpable in the acerate night air. From among them, an unspoken sentiment seemed to grow and form into a unanimous decision. Akon's fingers moved so fast with his counts that the joints on his hands began to ache. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Father Alufmi folded his hand at the same time Kamau looked away. Akon understood what was about to happen a second before the holy man's mouth uttered the words. Seventeen words, a bad number. Ekon Okojo, he said quietly, effectively, immediately your candidacy for the sons of the six has ended. You are dismissed.